بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما أما بعد إن شاء الله we'll go right into the questions for today the first questioner is asking my brother bought cats a few years ago to start a little business selling them. It's a very expensive breed of cats, $2,000 each. He, brought four, he bought four of them, and he is selling their kittens after they, they grow up a little. Is this halal to do? If not, what is he supposed to do now with the cats? He's keep him all, keeping all of them in his house. All right, this is a good question regarding the ruling of selling cats. Is this something that is permissible or not? And this is a matter where there is some difference of opinion of the ulama regarding and the majority of the scholars have said that selling cats is allowed, that it is permissible. And there is another opinion which is a minority opinion that some scholars said it is not permissible to do so. It's not permissible to sell cats. And the evidence for the opinion that it's not permissible is a hadith that can be found in Sahih Muslim, the hadith of Abu Zubair, where he asked Jabir, عنه, Jabir, one of the companions of the Prophet وسلم, he asked him about selling cats and dogs. عن أبي الزبير أنه سأل جابرا رضي الله عنه عن ثمن الكلب وس النور. فقال جابر زجر النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم عن ذلك. Where Abu Zubair asked Jabir radiallahu an about the price of dogs and cats, basically selling dogs and cats, is it permissible? And Jabir radiallahu an he said that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam disapproved of doing this. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim. All right. So the opinion that it's not permissible is based upon this hadith. Okay. So how does the majority interpret this hadith? The majority have said that it's permissible to buy and sell cats. So how do they interpret this hadith? Where Jabir radiallahu anh said, Zajara nabiyu sallallahu alayhi wa sallam an zalik. That Jabir radiallahu anh, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam disapproved of doing this. So some of the scholars who have permitted selling cats have said that all of these ahadith which prohibit the selling of cats, they are inauthentic. That's one opinion. But this opinion doesn't seem to hold much weight because this particular hadith is in Sahih Muslim. And you know Sahih Muslim, of course it's a very authentic collection of a hadith. So the hadith is authentic. All right, so if we accept that the hadith is authentic, how can we reconcile that with the majority opinion who have said that it is permissible to sell cats? So those scholars who have said that it is permissible and they also agree that this hadith is authentic. They say this hadith, which seems to prohibit the selling of cats, it's a hadith that shows that it is makruh to sell and buy cats. Not that it's haram. They're saying what the Prophet ﷺ meant is that it is something that is discouraged. But if someone does it, it would not be a sin regarding cats. So that is one interpretation as well. So the majority of the ulama have said that, you know, it is permissible to sell cats. Then there is the opinion, as we mentioned, that, that some scholars have said that it is haram based upon their literal interpretation of this hadith. So basically, if your brother is doing this as a business, then according to the majority of the scholars, this business would be halal and it would be permissible that he's selling cats. But according, according to, you know, the minority opinion, it would be considered impermissible. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Next question is asking, what is the ruling on day trading, such as buying a stock and selling it within the same week or the same day? If it's not permissible, what is the minimum amount of time someone should hold on to a stock before selling or the intention when buying the stock? All right, so as long as the stocks that you're dealing with are halal, then it's permissible to deal with them. It's permissible to buy them and it's permissible to sell them. And there is no time limit 
that you have once after buying them, that you have to hold them for a certain period of time before you sell them. But the only thing here is that you must take possession of the stock before you sell it. If you buy a stock and you haven't taken possession of it yet, it has not been registered in your name as the owner, then you cannot sell it until you take possession of it. Because in Islam, we're not allowed to sell things until we have possession of them. Right? So if you buy something, before selling it, you must take possession of it. Once you take possession of it, then you are allowed to sell it. So if that can be done within the same day, if you buy a stock and you're able to take possession of it, it's registered in your name the same day, and then you sell it after that, that's fine. If it happens during the same week, that's fine. So there is no minimum or maximum period, period that you have to hold it, but the only point is that you must take possession of it. It must come into your name. You must have control over it and possession of it, and then and only then are you allowed to sell it. Next question is asking with the regards to the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ said not to blow onto your drink. Is this a prohibition or recommendation and does this apply to food as well? So there's the hadith of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an, where he mentions anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam naha an yutanaffasa fil inai aw yunfakha fi. Where Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu an, he said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited that a vessel a vessel of food or drink, like a glass or a cup or a bowl or a plate. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited that this should be breathed into or blown into. Right? So this is something that should be avoided. But it is not something that is haram. It's not something that's impermissible to do this. Rather, it is makruh. So the ulama have said it is disliked to blow on your food. But if someone did it, it would not be considered a sin. If food is too hot, for example, then it's better not to blow on the food to cool it down. Just wait patiently for it to cool down a little bit and then eat it. But sometimes when food is too hot or a drink is too hot, someone wants to blow on it to make it colder and, and, and then drink it. It's not a sin if somebody does this, but it is discouraged to do this. And it, it shows a, somewhat of a lack of manners to do this blowing on food or blowing in a drink it is something that is against good etiquette and also it, it shows a lack of patience as well right hot food you can't just wait a few minutes for it to cool down before eating it you have to blow on it just so you can save 30 seconds or one minute right it shows a lack of patience as well and a Muslim should have patience in these matters as well right so it is something that is not recommended to do breathing into food or blowing onto food it is against good etiquette and it's against good manners and it is something that the Prophet ﷺ discouraged but it is makruh and it does not reach the level of being haram. Like if somebody did it, it would not be counted as a sin against this person but if somebody left it in order to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and did not blow in it and just waited, then inshallah they will be rewarded for not doing it. They will be rewarded for not blowing into the food. Right? So it's a, it's a strong recommendation to avoid doing this. And, and we should try our best to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and avoid blowing or breathing into our food. But if somebody did it, we would not say that this person committed something haram. Rather, rather he did something that is makruh. He did something that is disliked and that is not recommended. Next questioner is asking... Uh, in the last week Q&A you talked about khul'a but in the US law after a divorce separation it is 50-50 and child support you'll have to give to the wife if the kids stay with the mom alright so you know the, the US laws regarding divorce and alimony and this and that it's not something that is generally compatible with the sharia of Islam the sharia has its own legis Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated certain rules in the sharia regarding to divorce and spending after divorce and spending on the children and the US law is different than that right so for example in some states if, if, a, if someone gets divorced then the wife takes 50% of the property or you know if it's the other way around the husband takes 50% of the property whatever it is right right this is something that uh, does not have any basis in Islamic law so what is legislated is that if a man divorces a woman, then he is obligated to spend upon her during her idda period. When a man divorces his wife, during her idda, 
he is obligated to spend upon her just as if he was just as if she is still his wife she has to he has to spend on her on her on her food on her clothing she, he has to provide a home for her during the idda period but after the idda period is over and the divorce is finalized then he is not obligated to spend upon her anymore now she's you know she's not his wife anymore and he is not responsible for her anymore so he spends upon her during the idda after the idda is over he does not have to spend on her anymore as for the children that they share then of course the father is still going to be the father even after the divorce so he is still obligated to spend upon the children he is still obligated to spend upon the children and if the children are staying with the mother then he is obligated to give her some amount of money in return for her taking care of the children she's taking care of the children his children and they're living they're living with her he's not living with them and she's doing all the work taking care of them taking care of their needs you know being there for them and he's not present for that so yes he does have to pay her some amount in lieu of her taking the responsibility of taking care of his children right but as for anything more than that then this is something that is not prescribed in islam so he has to take care of the children of course they are still his children he has to uh pay the wife basically or the ex-wife because she's taking care of this duty of taking care of those children but as for him having to give her 50% of of his assets or something like that then no this is not something that has any basis in the sharia and this is a type of oppression that has no basis in islamic law so it's probably a good idea you know for people who get married in western societies to have actually a prenuptial agreement right it's it's a good idea to document all of this and and you know clearly state that in the case of a divorce all of the rules or all of the the spending will be based upon the rules of islam and it needs to be mentioned exactly what will be given and what will not be given right yes the the children's responsibility is upon uh, is still upon the father to take care of them the husband will pay for all of the expenses of the wife during her idda period after the idda period if she takes custody of the children he will pay her a certain amount and it should be documented how much he's going to pay her he will pay her a certain amount in lieu of her taking care of the children all of these things should be should be written down in order to protect the rights of both parties especially if someone is living in non-muslim lands right so having a prenuptial agreement can help protect some of those rights because of the fact that you know the laws of of the land do not necessarily conform with the laws of the sharia so we want to make sure we're doing everything according to the sharia and you know a, a prenuptial agreement is a way to ensure that everything is done according to the sharia and no one's rights will be oppressed in case of a divorce right so that is something to look about and that is what a lot of scholars recommend especially living in in lands where the sharia is not implemented like like western countries they recommend having these things documented in order to avoid any type of oppression in the case in case of a divorce next question is asking i don't know my exact condition and i am an introvert but i notice that whenever i'm around people I feel more depressed and unhappy would it be considered a sin if I limited myself towards my kinship I don't hold any grudges or hate towards them but I genuinely genuinely feel a lot better mentally when I'm studying the deen participating in hobbies and being away from people I'm not breaking full ties of kinship but I just don't interact with them frequently for the sake of sake of my mental health is this a sin All right so it is an obligation a very important obligation to keep the ties of kinship you have to keep contact with your relatives keep communication open with them talk to them see if they have any needs help them if they need help this is an an important obligation in islam that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has emphasized many times in the quran and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has also emphasized this greatly and as for a person who cuts off the ties of kinship this is a very major sin 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَهَلْ عَسَيْتُمْ إِنْ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ أَنْ تُفْسِدُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَتُقَطِّعُوا أَرْحَامَكُمْ أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ لَعَنَهُمُ اللَّهِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying about the people who cut off the ties of kinship, they cut off the relationships that they have with their relatives, these people are cursed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a very serious matter. Now, does it mean that you have to be in constant contact with all of your relatives every day? Like you have to call them every day and, and, and be in contact with them on a, on a consistent basis, 24 hours a day, seven days a week? No, it doesn't mean that. You don't need to go to extremes. But at the same time, you should, you should not let it go to the other extreme as well. Like a person who calls or calls a relative of his, calls his uncle or aunt once every 10 years. I called him, you know, in, in, in 20, 2010, and the next time I called him is in 2020. Every 10 years, I give him a phone call and talk to him for five minutes. I'm fulfilling my, my, my responsibilities towards him. I'm keeping the ties of kinship alive. No, this is, this is also not right. This is, this is too extreme, right? So it should be a reasonable amount of communication and interaction that you have with your kin and your relatives. Enough for them to know that you are not neglecting them. Enough for them to know that yes, you are there for them if they need you, that they can count on you if you need them, right? So it should be a reasonable amount of communication and interaction. So as long as you're doing this, you know, you're, you're, you're reasonably communicating with them and keeping, keeping that relationship alive to a reasonable amount, then inshallah, uh, you are okay, inshallah. And staying away from people and being, you know, being isolated from the people, in general, it's, it's, it's something that is discouraged in Islam. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Mu'min alladhi yukhalitu nas wa yasbiru ala adhahum afdalu that the believer who mixes with the people and is patient upon the difficulties that come with that. When you mix with a lot of people, then yes, there are going to be some, some issues that happen due to that, right? There are all sorts of people who have all sorts of attitudes and all sorts of thinking. So of course, if you're mixing with a lot of people, then definitely you're going to face some hardship doing that. Right? But if you still continue to mix with people and you're patient upon the difficulties that come with that, that believer is better than the believer who just stays away from everyone, does not mix with anyone. And of course, he's not patient upon what comes in that way because he's, he never exposes himself to that. He just stays by himself in order to avoid you know, any type of harm that may come because of interacting with the people. That's something that's discouraged. So you, know, you should try especially with your relatives, you know, keep communication open with them. If there's any issue or any problem, these things happen sometimes. Just be patient upon it and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for assistance and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be with you. As long as your intention is good, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help you with this. Next questioner is asking, is there a connection between the living and the deceased? For example, if I make dua or give charity or perform a voluntary good deed on behalf of a deceased family member, will the deceased family member be aware of it? Inshallah, yes. If you do this, if you do something good on behalf of a, a person, who a Muslim who has passed away, then inshallah, the, the person who has passed away will benefit from the good thing that you did on his behalf and will be made aware of it as well, inshallah. And this is based upon the hadith that was collected by Imam Ahmad, where it is mentioned that the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّ أَعْمَالَكُمْ تُعْرَضُوا عَلَىٰ أَقَارِبِكُمْ وَعَشَائِرِكُمْ مِنَ الْأَمْوَاتِ فَإِنْ كَانَ خَيْرًا إِسْتَبْشَرُوا بِهِ وَإِنْ كَانَ غَيْرَ ذَلِكَ قَالُوا اللَّهُمَّ لَا تُمِتْهُمْ حَتَّى تَهْدِيَهُمْ كَمَا هَدَيْتَنَا The Prophet ﷺ said, Surely your actions, the actions that you do, they are presented to your relatives from those who have passed away. So the actions that you do, your relatives who have died, they see those actions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala presents those actions to them. And if it's good actions that you're doing, if you're doing good things, then your relatives are happy with that. But if the actions that are presented to your relatives are bad actions, you're doing bad things and that is presented to your relatives, then they make dua, they say, Allahumma la tumithum hatta tahdiyahum kama hadaytana. They say, Allah. Allah, don't let them die until you guide them like you have guided us. 
right? So this hadith is evidence that yes, the, the, the relatives who have passed away, they, can, they are presented with the actions of their relatives who are alive. So if you're doing good actions on behalf of your relatives, inshallah, they will be made aware of that. So you do it and they benefit from it and they are made aware of it, inshallah. Next question is asking, is Islam, Iman, and Ihsan the three levels of faith? I heard a lecture about how Ihsan is superior, superior to Islam. I was a bit confused about this from the Hadith of Jibreel. Can you explain it? Okay, the Hadith of Jibreel, famous Hadith where Jibreel alayhi salam came in the form of a man and he asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam some questions while the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were present. Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam about Islam. What is Islam? And then he asked, what is Iman? And then he asked, what is Ihsan? So he asked about these three things. And then he asked about a sa'a. He asked about the final hour and its signs, right? But the part that we want to mention, it's a long hadith. The part that we want to talk about here is, what is Islam and Iman and Ihsan? Islam, as defined in the hadith of Jibreel, when Jibreel alayhi salam asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he said, ya Muhammad, أخبرني عن الإسلام. Tell me about Islam. And then the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, أن تشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وأن محمد رسول الله وتقيم الصلاة وتؤتي الزكاة وتحج البيت وتصوم رمضان. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, Islam, it means to testify that there is no one worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم is the messenger of Allah. To establish your prayers, to pay zakat, to make pilgrimage to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and to fast during the month of Ramadan. So he mentioned the five pillars of Islam. This is Islam. So a person who does these actions can be called a Muslim. Now, Iman. The next question Jibreel alayhi salam asks, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ iman. Tell me about Iman. And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, أَن تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وملائكته وكتبه ورسله واليوم الآخر وأن تؤمن بالقدر خيره وشره. He mentioned that iman is to believe in Allah and to believe in His angels and to believe in His books and to believe in His messengers and to believe in the last day and to believe in the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whatever happens good to you in your life, whatever happens bad, this is all from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's to actually believe this in your heart. So this is Iman. So Islam is about the outer actions. Like you pray your prayer, you pay zakat, you fast in the month of Ramadan. And Iman is about what is inside, what you really believe in your heart. So there can be a person who does the outer actions of Islam but he really doesn't have that strong belief in his heart. So he's, he'll be called a Muslim, but not necessarily a mu'min, because his belief is not strong. But if someone is a mu'min, someone has a strong belief of all of these things in his heart, then the outward actions will also automatically come. So that person will be a mu'min and he will be a Muslim. So a mu'min is a higher level. Because in addition to doing the outward actions, you have the internalization of that in your heart as well. That is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about some of the Bedouins who accepted Islam, but the Iman was not strong in their hearts. Some of the Bedouins who accepted Islam during the time of the Prophet ﷺ, they did it for different reasons. Sometimes they, did, they, they accepted Islam for political reasons because the Muslims were so strong at you know, the Muslims had become so strong eventually. So some of the disbelievers said, you know, we better just become Muslims because if we don't become Muslims, then, you know, that will be bad for us politically. So they became Muslims because of that. They didn't really have strong iman in their hearts. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about these people, Qalatil a'rabu amanna. These a'rab, these Bedouin Arabs, they said, amanna. They said, we believe, we have iman. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to say to them, Qul lam tu'minu. No, you don't have iman. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا But just say that we have submitted ourselves. We are Muslims. We're going to do the actions. We're going to pray. We're going to pay zakat. We're going to fast. We're going to do all of these things. Even though iman has not really penetrated their hearts yet. وَلَكِنْ قُولُوا أَسْلَمْنَا وَلَمَّا يَدْخُلِ الْإِيمَانُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Iman has not really penetrated your hearts yet. But 
وَإِن تُطِيعُوا اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ لَا يَلِدْكُمْ مِنْ أَعْمَالِكُمْ شَيْئًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ If you obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and His Messenger, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will not allow your, your deeds to go to waste. And eventually the iman, it will come inshaAllah. If the iman is not strong at first, but you do the outward actions sincerely, then inshaAllah the iman, it will grow in your heart. And you will reach the level of iman eventually inshaAllah. Right? So Islam is the outward actions. Iman is when, iman, when, when the belief actually penetrates your heart. So obviously that's a higher level. And Ihsan, it's even a higher level. Later on in the hadith, Jibreel السلام, asked the Prophet ﷺ, فَأَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِحْسَان Tell me about Ihsan. And then the Prophet وسلم, said, what is Ihsan? He said, أَن تَعْبُدَ اللَّهَ كَأَنَّكَ تَرَاهُ فَإِن لَمْ تَكُنْ تَرَاهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَرَاكُ it's to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as if you are seeing Him when you're praying. You're praying like you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in front of you. And even though you do not see Him, He surely sees you. So pray as if you're seeing Him. And if you can't do that, then pray with the knowledge that yes, He is seeing you. So how is your prayer going to be if you have that feeling? As if Allah, as if you're seeing Allah. Or if not that, as if Allah is seeing you. How is your prayer going to be? You're going to be very focused on your prayer. You're going to be very careful in your prayer. Right? So that is ihsan. That's even a higher, higher level. So if someone can reach that type of a level, if someone has ihsan, then obviously he also has iman. You cannot get to a level of ihsan without having iman penetrate your heart. So ihsan is a very high level of devotion and worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is the differentiation of these three these three terms, Al-Islam and Iman and Ihsan. Next questioner is asking, if a Muslim passed away years ago, can I still perform the Janazah prayer individually after a couple of years? On the day of the Janazah, I felt as if I was in a state of shock and I was numb to what was really happening. I feel guilty that I didn't pray the Janazah prayer to benefit the deceased Muslim. Yes, you can do this, inshallah. If you didn't pray the Janazah prayer at the time of the Janazah, and even if some years have passed by, and you want to go to the grave site and pray the janazah over there, then inshallah that is something that is permissible. And uh, there, is, there is actually evidence for this from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When there was a, a woman in Medina, her name was Umm Mihjan radiallahu anha. She was a poor woman and she used to clean the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She used to clean al-masjid al-Nabawi. And one night she died. And the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they buried her and they didn't want to, to wake up the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for this. They thought, okay, you know, she died, we'll just take care of it, we'll do her janazah, we'll bury her. No need to disturb the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about this, right? So they buried her, they took care of it. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, later on he noticed, where is she? This woman who used to clean the masjid of Mihjan, what happened to her? He noticed that she's missing. So then... They told the Prophet ﷺ, Ya Rasulullah, last night she passed away. The Prophet ﷺ, immediately he noticed it. The next day he noticed it, that she's not around. So he asked them what happened to her. They said, Ya Rasulullah, she passed away. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Afala kuntum adhantumuni? Why didn't you tell me? And it, it's as if they didn't think it was like such a big deal that they needed to wake up the Prophet ﷺ for this, you know, this poor woman who just used to clean the masjid. They didn't think it was such a big deal, but the Prophet ﷺ made them realize that yes, it was actually a big deal. أَفَلَا كُنْتُمْ أَذَنْتُمُونِ Why didn't you let me know? Then he said, دُلُّونِي عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهَا Show me where is her grave. Where did you bury her? فَدَلُّوهُ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِهَا So they showed the Prophet ﷺ where her grave was. And he went there, فَصَلَّى عَلَيْهَا And he prayed upon her. He prayed the janazah prayer for her. Right? So this shows that it is permissible. If you didn't pray someone's janazah prayer and then later on you want to go and pray their janazah prayer, then it is permissible to do so, inshallah. Next question is asking, what types of wealth are to have zakat paid on them? Is it just gold, silver, cash, livestock, etc.? Yes, it is these things. Gold, silver, cash, cattle. Like if someone has a certain amount of camels or goats or sheep or cows, they have to pay zakat on that. Uh, also, uh, business profits, uh, also items uh, you know business items that are prepared for sale right zakat is paid upon the value of that uh, fruits and grains that are stored like uh, like for example nuts 
like like you know hazelnuts, almonds, these type of things that can be stored. Dates are a type of fruits that can be stored. As for fruits that cannot be stored, like fresh fruits, like bananas and apples and oranges that you can't store, it will go bad. Then there's no zakat on these things, right? So yeah, the, these are some of the things that zakat is obligatory upon. And uh, the questioner is asking, is having wealth over the nisab level for one full hijri year the only condition which makes zakat obligatory? No, the, the conditions that make zakat obligatory is that the person who's paying the zakat, the person who is the owner of the property is a Muslim. And he should have at least the nisab for one year. The nisab is the minimum amount of wealth that a person has to have in order for zakat to be obligatory. For example, if a person doesn't have any money, he just has like 50 bucks for one year. Does he have to pay zakat on that $50? No, he doesn't because $50 does not reach the nisab. Right? So the nisab, uh, if someone has cash, if someone has cash, then the nisab is based upon what the nisab for gold or silver would be. The nisab for gold is 20 mithqals, which converts to 85 grams of gold. So if someone has gold, they have at least 85 grams of gold or more, then they have to pay zakat on that if they've had it for one year. If someone has 200 dirhams of silver, which is equivalent to 595 grams of silver, someone has 595 grams of silver for a period of one year, then they have to pay zakat on that. But if it's less than this, then they don't have to pay. Okay, what about cash? Do you do it based upon gold or silver? Because the nisab for gold, which is 85 grams, and the nisab for silver, which is 595 grams of silver, there's a big difference in the value, the cash value of these two things. 85 grams of gold is worth a lot. And 595 grams of silver is worth much less than that. So if you have cash, are you going to base it on the, on the nisab of silver or the nisab of gold? The strongest opinion of the ulama regarding this is you base, if you have cash, you base it upon whatever is the lower, the lower nisab. And in this case, silver, the value of silver, 595 grams of silver is lower than the value of 85 grams of gold. So if you, for, for cash, you would base it, you would base your nisab upon silver. So you see 595 grams of silver. How much is it worth? If you have that amount of cash for one year, then you will have to pay zakat on it. If you have less than that amount, then you would not have to pay zakat on it. Do age and sanity have any effect on zakat becoming obligatory on a Muslim? No, no effect on this. So even if there's a child and he has some wealth, that was uh, left to him, for example, a child who inherited wealth from his father. And this child is still young. He has not reached the age of puberty yet. Zakat still has to be paid on his wealth. And of course, whoever his guardian is, is going to be the one who takes care of that on his behalf. But the zakat is still wajib upon his wealth. Even if someone is majnoon, or someone is, you know, doesn't have, uh, uh, someone is not mentally there. They've lost their mind, right? but this person has wealth in his name, then zakat is still obligatory upon that wealth and whoever is taking care of that person is the one who will pay the zakat from his wealth on his behalf. Right? So he'll take out from the wealth of that person who he's taking care of and he will use that money to pay the zakat on that wealth. So regardless of a person's age, regardless of a person's mental status, zakat is still obligatory. Zakat is still obligatory. Also, why do many Muslims wait until Ramadan to pay their zakat? Many Muslims like to pay their zakat in Ramadan because Ramadan, of course, is a month where good deeds, the reward for good deeds is greater. But it's not permissible to delay your zakat past one year. So, for example, if someone received some wealth, let's say now, you received $100,000, now it's Rajab. You cannot wait until the, your, your zakat will be obligatory on it the next Rajab. This is Rajab. And now your zakat is going to, if you still have that 100,000 or you know, at least enough for the nisab to still be there, if you still have it, it will, the zakat will be obligatory when? Next to Rajab. Because now it's Rajab, it will be obligatory next Rajab. But then, you can, then someone might think, okay, you know, Rajab, Ramadan is only going to be two more months away, so I'm not going to pay my zakat next Rajab. I'm just going to wait until Ramadan and pay. No, that's not permissible. 
because you delayed it past one year. You cannot do that. But on the other hand, if someone received $100,000 now in Raja, and Ramadan is in two months from now, inshallah, this Ramadan is in two months. So in two months, when Ramadan comes, you say, okay, I'm going to pay my zakat, even though it's not due yet, it's due next Rajab. But I want to pay it in Ramadan, so I'm going to pay it in advance in Ramadan. Then that is permissible. You can pay the zakat in advance in Ramadan, then it's okay. And then, when the next Rajab comes, you don't have to pay the zakat because you already paid it in Ramadan, you already paid it in advance. And then the next Ramadan comes and you say, okay, now I'm going to pay for the next year's worth in advance as well in this Ramadan. And in that way, you can arrange for your zakat to be paid in Ramadan. But the important thing is do not delay anything more than a year. If you do some in advance, it's okay. You can do it in advance up to, up to two years even. But not more than two years. You can do two years in advance of paying zakat. But as for delaying zakat over one year, then that is something that is not permissible. Next question is asking if something intoxicates in large amounts, it is haram in small amounts. Yes. This is applicable when a Muslim buys something that may contain a small amount of an ingredient that intoxicates when consumed alone. For a Muslim, would it be prohibited when cooking or baking to actually use ingredients like vanilla extract in their own kitchen with small amounts? No, it would not be permissible to use something that has alcohol in large amounts and mix it with something to make the final product something that has alcohol in small amounts. It's not permissible to use in the first place any ingredient that has alcohol in large amounts. So vanilla ex extract. If someone has vanilla extract where the alcohol content of this is very high, right? And it is something that is intoxicating. You cannot use this. You cannot use it even if the final product that you're making with it is going to only have alcohol in a very small unintoxicating amount but the fact that you're using something that can intoxicate at all that's something that you're not allowed to use the the rule here where the prophet ﷺ said that whatever intoxicates in a large amount even a small amount of it it is it, it is haram so if it does not intoxicate in a large amount then it would be permissible to use that applies to the final product it does not give you permission to use any intoxicant to make something. Even if the final product will be something that is not intoxicating. Right? It does not give you permission to do that. It just gives you permission to, to use something or to eat something that has already been made. And it has a negligible, negligible amount of intoxicant in it that will never intoxicate in any quantity. It just gives you permission to buy that or to eat that. It does not give you permission to produce something using something that has a large amount of alcohol like vanilla extract. So no, it would not be allowed to use vanilla extract if it has a large amount of, of alcohol in it while cooking. What is the ruling on nutmeg when buying food or sweets that have a little bit of it? Can nutmeg be used in a Muslim's kitchen? So the ulama have also said nutmeg, pure nutmeg, it is an intoxicant as well. So you're not allowed to use pure nutmeg in cooking. But if you bought a sweet that has a small amount of nutmeg in it, such a small amount that no matter how much of that final product, that sweet, no matter how much of it you eat, it will never cause you to have any intoxication, then it's permissible to buy that, to buy that sweet or to buy that food that has a small amount of nutmeg. But for you to buy nutmeg, pure nutmeg in and of itself, which is an intoxicant, and for you to use that, to make something or to cook something, that would not be allowed. What would be allowed is to you, if somebody bought like a, a, a spice mix, there are certain mixes that have many spices in them and nutmeg is a part of it. Nutmeg is included in it. It's a whole mix and nutmeg is in it as well. But the amount of nutmeg is in it, in the whole thing, it's so small, the proportion of nutmeg is so small that it, 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 the, the spice mix would never intoxicate anyone. It is, it is not an intoxicant anymore. So that type of spice mix, yes, it would be permissible to buy and it would be permissible to use that in your cooking. But nutmeg alone, pure nutmeg, is considered an intoxicant and it's not allowed to use that in cooking. Uh, next question is asking, unfortunately, I missed my Fajr Salah. I try to wake up early to perform Tahajjud before my Fajr Salah and also delay with their prayer, which I incorporate as the last rak'ah of Tahajjud. I also try to perform two rak'at of Nafil Wudu prayer in the beginning. 
Now if I miss getting up early, I actually miss my witr of the previous day and two rakat of sunnah and two rakat of the fard of fajr prayer. Can I offer the miss salah soon after I wake up? Two rakat of wudu prayer, three rakat of witr prayer, two rakat of sunnah and two rakat of fajr. Can you please con uh, confirm the sequence and anything different in intentions and procedures to perform these miss prayers? Okay, if you missed fajr and you also missed the witr from the night before. Uh, you just overslept and you woke up after Fajr prayer was over. So you didn't pray your Witr and you also didn't pray the Sunnah of Fajr and you didn't pray the, the Fard of Fajr. So what are you supposed to start with here? You're supposed to start with the Fajr prayer before you do the Witr. Because the, the, because the Fajr prayer is obligatory and the Witr prayer is not. And the Prophet ﷺ said, مَن نَامَ عَن صَلَاةٍ أَوْ نَسِيَهَا فَلْيُصَلِّهَا إِذَا ذَكَرَهَا Whoever oversleeps through a Salah or forgets it, he forgot to pray, then let him pray as soon as he remembers it. So let's say you went to sleep, you had the intention you're going to wake up for, for tahajjud and for witr, and then you're going to pray fajr, but you know, you just overslept and you woke up in the morning. Now it's like 8 o'clock in the morning and you woke up. So what should you do? Immediately you go and make wudu and you pray the fajr prayer. You pray the sunnah of fajr and the fard of fajr. As for the witr prayer that you missed, you would not pray it as a witr. You would not make it up as witr in the daytime. Witr means an odd number. So instead you would make it up as an even number. For example, if you were going to pray three witr in the night, but you missed it and you're making it up in the day, it's going to become four rakat, two and two, instead of two and one. Right? So you don't, when you make up the witr prayer, you don't make it up as a witr. Rather, you make it up as an even number, you just add extra rakat. So instead of two and one, it becomes two and two. So you'll pray the witr prayer in that way. But more important is to make up the fajr prayer. That would be first and foremost. And you can make it up with the sunnah as well. Pray the two sunnah of fajr and the two fard of fajr. Then after that, you can make up the witr prayer by making it an even number. And as for the wudu prayer, if you make wudu, you can pray two rakat, that's fine. But if you're already praying another prayer, Anyways, you make wudu and it's time for fajr. So you pray two rakat of the sunnah prayer of fajr. Then that takes the place of the wudu prayer. You don't need to pray the wudu prayer separately. If there's already a salat that you're going to be praying anyways, then that, that covers that. So there's no need to make an extra two rakat for uh, wudu prayer. The next questioner is asking, while changing the diaper or cleaning a baby, does touching the genital of the baby break the wudu? Okay, so this is an area, again, where there is some difference of opinion of the ulama. And the reason why there's a difference of opinion of the ulama is because of uh, a couple of hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. One hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, he said, مَنْ مَسَّ ذَكَرَهُ فَلْيَتَوَضَّ That whoever touches his private part, then let him make wudu. But then there's another hadith where uh, Talq ibn Ali radiallahu an asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, if someone uh, touches their private part while they are praying, alayhi al wudu, that does this person have to perform wudu again? And then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, La, innaha bud'atun mink. He said, No, he doesn't have to make wudu, it's just a part of him, it's just a part of his body that he touched. So he does not need to make wudu, right? So how do we reconcile these, these hadith? Some of the ulama have said that the first hadith, man masa dhakarahu that whoever, whoever touches his private part, let him make wudu. Some of the ulama have said that this hadith is stronger than the other one. So they said anyone who touches their private part, they must make wudu. This, this is something that breaks wudu and they have to make wudu. Then there are others from the ulama who have said that it does not break the wudu. And when the Prophet ﷺ said, Man masa dhakarahu whoever touches his private part, let him make wudu. They said that this, uh, this instruction from the Prophet ﷺ was not a command, but rather it's just a, a recommendation. Like it's better to make wudu. But if somebody didn't make wudu, then it, it's okay. Their wudu is not broken by it, but it's still better to make wudu if somebody touches their private part. There is this explanation as well. Right? So it is a matter of some difference of opinion. And Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, he was of the opinion that it does not break the wudu. Uh, and if someone touches their private part, then it is not obligatory for them to renew their wudu. Right? So it is a matter of, of, of difference of opinion. And then some ulama have also said that it depends if somebody touched their private part with the desire, 
then it breaks the wudu. But if, they, if it was not done with any type of desire, then it does not break the wudu. So there are many different interpretations of it as well. Right? So based on this, when changing the diaper or cleaning a baby, if, okay, if you change the diaper and if you didn't actually touch the private part with your hand, right? If you're cleaning the baby with a wipe, for example, or something, right? And that, that wipe is actually what's touching the private part of the baby and your hand didn't actually touch it, then for sure, no, your wudu is not broken. But if you actually touch the private part of the baby with the palm of your hand, with the inside of your hand, then does it break your wudu or not? There is a matter, this is a matter of difference of opinion. So those who say that, yes, touching the private part breaks the wudu, they would say that, yes, the wudu is broken and you would have to make wudu. And those who say that it doesn't, they would say it does not break the wudu. Right? So it is a, a matter of difference of opinion. If you want to be on the safe side and make wudu, that is good. But if it's difficult, because you know, if it's, especially if it's a newborn baby and you're changing the diaper all the time, multiple times per day, and it becomes difficult, if you want to follow the, the other opinion, which has a very strong basis as well, that it doesn't break the wudu, then inshallah, inshallah, there's no problem in that as well. Next question is asking, in a lecture we found that calling my wife by her name is a sunnah. Is it authentic? Well, the Prophet وسلم, yeah, he used to address his wives by their names. Like, he used to address Aisha radiallahu anha by calling her by her name, Ya Aisha. So yes, there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with this and it's fine to address your wife by her name. What are the things that can be sunnah? In our day-to-day -day life, human does things like eating, eating, some, eating something three times. Are such stuff from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam also sunnah? For example, one alim said that after getting up from sleep, rubbing the eyes and the face for getting rid of sleep is sunnah. Yes, any of these things. If the Prophet ﷺ did anything and you follow him and you follow him in doing that because you want to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ, like you know you break your fast with dates you eat an odd number of dates because the Prophet ﷺ did that yes this is sunnah and this is something that you will be rewarded for uh, wiping the face and the eyes to get rid of sleep when someone gets up in the night for tahajjud this is also sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. from the hadith of uh, from the hadith where it is mentioned istayqadha rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam min nawmihi faja'ala yamsahu nawmahu an wajhihi bi yadayhi that the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he woke up from his sleep and then he, he, he was wiping the sleep off of his face with his hands right by rubbing the face or rubbing the eyes to wake up from the sleep when the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam got up for tahajjud so yes this is sunnah the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did this so if a person does this in order to follow the way of the Prophet ﷺ, then yes, it's sunnah and the person will be rewarded for it, inshallah. Next question is asking, at what age should we separate the bed of a baby or of children? If you mean separating you know, children from each other in the beds, this should be done by the age of 10. Children who have reached the age of 10, they should not sleep in the same bed anymore. They should have their own separate bed and they should have their own separate blanket. That's from the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam where he said, Muru awladakum bis salati wa hum abna'u sab'i sinin wadribuhum alayha wa hum abna'u ashrin wa farriqu baynahum fil madaji'. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Command your children to pray when they reach the age of seven. And you can, you can discipline them, you can physically discipline them if they don't pray when they reach the age of ten. And also at the age of 10, separate them in their beds. So uh, when, when a child reaches the age of 10, you know, they should have their own separate bed and their own separate blanket and the children should be separated at that age. The next questioner is asking, can the Quran be read by looking during Taraweeh Salah? If someone is leading Salah to Taraweeh and they're doing it by reading a Mus'haf, is this permissible? If an Imam does, has not memorized the Quran and they are, they are reading from the Mus'haf, it is permissible. But as for the people who are praying behind the imam, no, they should not hold it. They should not hold the mushaf, rather they should just be listening to the recitation of the imam. And of course it's better, it's better if there's an imam who has memorized the Qur'an who can lead the salah without looking at the mushaf. That's preferred and that is better. But if it's not possible, then if there's an imam who's reciting from looking at the mushaf or if someone is praying on their own and they want to read long surahs so they're looking at the mushaf and praying, the Taraweeh prayer or the Hajjud prayer, then it is, it is allowed, inshallah. But as for someone who's praying behind the Imam, no. They should not be holding a Mus'haf. They should just be listening to the recitation of the Imam. The next questioner is asking, can we read on both Thursday night and Friday Suratul Kahf to obtain more rewards? 
This is something that has not been narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the Sahaba that they would read it on Thursday, on the night after Thursday and the day of Friday. So if you do it on the night before Friday or on the day of Friday, then that's okay. But to do both, this is something that has not been, uh, you know, that it has not been narrated that the Sahaba radiallahu anhum used to do this type of thing. So either do it on the night before Friday, you know, the night that comes after Thursday, or do it on the day of Friday. Uh, you know, either way is fine. But as for doing both, then, you know, this is something that, that is, is not from the way of the, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's not, it, and it has not been uh, narrated from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam doing it both, doing it on the night and in the day. So one time is enough. If you do it in the night, it's fine. If you do it in the day, it is also fine. And when we say Friday night, it means the night that comes before Friday, the night that comes after Thursday. So after the sun sets on Thursday, you can recite Surah Al-Kahf. Or if you want to do it the next day at the day of Jumu'ah, in the morning or after Salat al-Jumu'ah or whatever, then you can do it on that day if, if you prefer that. But as for doing it, doing it both times, then uh, you know, this is something that does not have uh, you know, any, any evidence from the Sunnah of the Prophet And the last questioner is asking, uh, what is the minimum length that men must keep their beards? I've heard a narration that the Prophet said to simply leave the beard and have also heard that some of the Sahaba would trim their beards to a fist length. Um, yes, so the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ about the beard, there are a number of them. One of them is uh, where the Prophet ﷺ said, قُصُّ الشوارب وَأَعْفُ الْلِحَا خَالِفُ الْمُشْرِكِينَ The Prophet ﷺ said, uh, cut the mustache and leave the beard and be different from the mushrikeen. All right? And the mushrikeen, uh, especially the Persians, at that time, they used to have big, long mustaches, right? And they used to shave their beards. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered the Muslims to be uh, different from that, right? So qussu shawarib, like cut your mustaches. The Persians, they grow their mustache big. They don't, they don't cut it. So you be different from them. Cut your mustache. Wa'afu liha, and leave your beard. The Persians, they shave their beard, so you don't do that. You, le you leave your beard. Khalifu al-mushrikeen, be different from the mushrikeen. And it has been narrated from some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ that they would uh, cut it, the beard, if it, if it came past one fist length. Like if someone could grab their beard by their fist from the bottom and if it came under the hand, if it was growing past one's fist length, then they would cut the excess portion. So that has been narrated from Abu Huraira that he, that he used to do that and also Abdullah ibn Umar used to do that. So that's fine if somebody wants to do that as well, inshallah. But uh, shaving should not be done, right? Shaving the beard should not be done. And uh, the questioner is asking, like if your parents are telling you to shave your beard, then what should you do? You should try to kindly explain to them the, the instruction of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And that, you know, we are, we are obligated to follow the instructions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And of course, you know, there is the rule لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق that there is no obedience to any creation if it involves disobedience to the creator but of course, if, you know, if, the, if they are parents then you have to explain it to them in, with good manners and in a very good way and, you know, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow them, you know, to, to, to see the truth and to see that the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa is the best way so if you can explain it to them in a nice way and, and, and do it, inshallah, in a nice way then, then, then hopefully they will, they will, they will see, uh, you know, they will see the importance of, of following this instruction of the Prophet ﷺ and they will allow you to do it, inshallah, right? So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us the truth as the truth and allow us to follow it. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to show us falsehood as, as falsehood and allow us to stay away from it. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to benefit us from the knowledge that he teaches us and we ask him to allow us to implement beneficial knowledge in our lives. Ameen. بارك الله فيكم والله أعلم صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين